And good morning once again, Third Church family. You know, scripture tells us that we're born in sin and shapen in iniquity. Well, baked into that characterization is the fact that when we're born, we're just too selfish. Too selfish to share. Too selfish to love unconditionally. Too, too selfish to maintain meaningful, deep relationships. It's all about me. It's how we're born. And, but our success in life is predicated on coming to the realization that it's not just about me. Yeah. And by success, I'm not, I'm not talking about the gaining of more earthly treasures, but the treasures that are more tangible and precious than just earthly possessions. Our prayer today is, is for the yokes of separatism, racism, classism, sexism, and all of those things that, that categorically separate us are broken. And we're, one, we're able to see that there is extreme value in one another and not just walk through life wanting to be valued by others. Let us pray this morning. God of miracles, God of deliverance, God of increase. God, we've prayed for revival, for prayer. We've prayed for revival in our study life. But today, God, we pray for a fellowship revival. We, we, we have lived so long in a society that prides itself on separation from one another, being in competition with one another, praying on one another and not praying for one another. And this, this, this attitude and this disposition has infected the church and rendered the church helpless in our effort to work together, helpless in our effort to love one another, because we're so suspicious of one another. We spread rumors about one another and we sit at times gathered as collective individuals. God, this morning we pray for a change of heart. God, this morning we pray for a renewed mind that the barriers that the world has created are destroyed. Yes. That, that if we look at our brothers and sisters and seek to serve them. Remind us today that Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. So we pray this morning for a servant's heart. That we give grace to one another for the wrongdoings that have been perpetrated against us that we seek to be restorers and not just people who stand firm watching and protecting these walls that separate us. Remind us again, oh God, that we need one another to survive. Bless this message today as we receive the word that it's not just about me. Bless us today in our understanding and our growth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you this morning. Let us get ready for the word. Amen, amen, and bless God. Today we begin chapter two in our study of the book of James. Why don't you read along with me? James two verses one through 13. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, 
Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised for those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are, dra who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, he also said, do not commit murder. If you, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act to those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God bless the readers, hearers, and doers of the word. I want to use for a subject for our study today, it's not just about me. It's not just about me. Well, this passage begins a new section in James, a discussion of various temptations and trials that are, that are common to all believers. There are certain temptations and trials that are constantly confronting us. One of the strongest is that it's showing partiality or favoritism of discrimination against people. This is something that, 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 that looking at our society is ingrained in us at an early age. We are separated into cans and can'ts and the haves and the have nots, the, the drafted and the undrafted. We take tests in schools that divide us. Parents divide us as they have their favorite children. Even our sports team coaches use phrases like, everyone will be treated fairly, but everyone won't be treated the same. Meaning that the stars will get more preferential treatment than others. With these societal truths, there are endless pursuits for that coveted position of being the favorite, the elite, the one who gets the preferential treatment. And we know too well because we're living in it. This does not produce a very functional society as it relates to relationships because this atmosphere creates a selfish, me first society where if you're going to be in my life or if I engage you, then it's only for what you can do to further my cause to be the favorite or to achieve the elite status in society. And those who possibly threaten that achievement they're avoided at all costs, ignored or passed over. This is the reality of what many don't seem to be, uh, is, is the reason why some pe people aren't functional in their church life. Because serving the Lord is a threat to achieving their societal status of favorite. Yeah. You ever notice why it seems that Everything else we want to do in life it is done with seemingly, you know, no effort. And there's a passion and a drive to do what we want to do that's insatiable. But when it comes to serving the Lord, we stall in our efforts. This is primarily because serving the Lord is not about furthering our own cause, but furthering the cause of Jesus. Because, see, I can't further my own cause with the cause of Jesus in my way. There's no, there, there, there's no worship left for Jesus because all of my worship needs to be spent on myself because the, the, the team of me needs all of my attention. Which brings us to Mark 8 and 36, where it says, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Well, I hear that verse and say, well, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a lot to be gained because so many seem to be pursuing the accolades of the world, yet 
uh, their, their spiritual disposition lay in ruin because they're surrounded by people telling them how good they are, how, how getting promotions and accumulating worldly things in this, in this world seems to be, they, they, in this world they seem to be winning in this game of life. And if this world is all that there is, guess what? Continue on. But I believe there is a place prepared for me by a Lord that died for me and is returning to deliver me. I, I believe that any status that I achieve because uh, I've been given by this same Lord. So I don't have to be in an endless pursuit of status because the only status that I need, guess what, is saved. The only status that I need is, guess what, child of God. The only status that I need is servant of the most high. I, God. And this status sometimes has an appearance of the same status sought in the world, but there are vast differences in how it is revealed. When we seek to achieve our own status, what then happens is cliques start to form, and there are entrance requirements to gaining access into the cliques. And there are devastatingly pre prejudice, and it, and it becomes painfully obvious whether you're worthy or not. Others are ostracized, even oppressed by our actions and our reactions. Again, remember, when I'm trying to further my own status in the world, I surround myself with people who can assist in just that. People who make me feel good about myself. People who tell me how good I am. People who tell me what I want to hear. But when my status is validated by Jesus, I realize that I've not been given this status by Jesus to be served, but to serve. Listen, if I already have been given elite status by Jesus, then, then I'll look to help others, to serve others, to achieve the same status that I enjoy. When God sends someone into my path that does not seem to have the same status that I have in Jesus, then I won't ignore them, but I will look to see what my God can do in their life. Because when my status is saved, I understand that, there, that all of this earthly stuff will perish. And, and if your status is only validated by earthly stuff, then you will perish with the earthly stuff. But my status is validated in Jesus. I don't have to, to, to worry about the endless pursuit of earthly stuff because, because my destination is with the Father in heaven. See, James paints this picture. And he uses an illustration in our scripture text this morning of a person who obviously has earthly status, who is given special treatment versus the poor person who is told to sit on the floor. This is a prime example of, 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 of what I've been talking about. In the assembly of the church, James is speaking of, they, they have been infected by this pursuit of earthly treasures. This is why the rich man is given special treatment you got to ask yourself, I wonder why. Well, I'm glad you asked because of what the rich man be a, may be able to do for the assembly. Ha, ah, did you get that? See, the poor person is treated poorly because of the assumption that they have nothing to offer to elevate the status of the assembly. I know that the church is made up of individuals what times bring these ideals of separation and uh, this uh, uh, the, of, the, of the, the cans and the can'ts or the haves and the have nots into the church. But the church is a place where James says this way of thinking is improper and it's not tolerated because we have fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus is the Lord who left the glory of heaven and came to this corruptible world to save all men. He humbled himself, laid aside the highest position of exaltation and the supreme honor of God himself. He laid aside all the glory, majesty, brilliance, and the splendor of heaven and came to utter poverty and humiliation to this earth in order to save each and every one of us. If the Lord of glory loved us that much, and all who believe and follow him must humble themselves, and love the poor and the lowly of this earth just as much. 
All believers must, must, must do the, the, what, what the Lord of, God, of glory did. Humble themselves. Reach out to bring all men to the Lord Jesus Christ so that they may be saved. Reach out to the poor and lowly just as well as the rich and high. The charge is clear. Believers who truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, are not to show partiality or favoritism. This is something that we need to reflect on while we are apart during this pandemic time. When we, when we, we, we have to come back to in-person service, a better church. You see, before the shutdown, we may not have been overt in our actions at the church. James is calling out. But we're guilty of showing partiality and favoritism. When we come in on Sunday and sit in our same seat every week. Now, some would call that being creature of habit, and I get that. But the bigger picture is here that we're not seeking to be a blessing to others. We have been called by God to be a part of this entire fellowship, not just the part that's gathered around the fourth pew center aisle. When we return, we need to be active in our fellowship by seeking out different uh, person every week to engage them, see what they do, how they do it. Is it anything that I can help you or serve you in a greater capacity? Can I pray for your health situation, employment situation? Can I pray for a relationship situation? We need to be the heart. We need a heart set that, that, that we're called to serve one another. But we can't get to that point if we just seek to be served by walking around with an arrogant attitude of let others come to me. You know, people always want to say that God works in mysterious ways. You know, that's true. But I think we use it as, a, as an excuse for not wanting to learn the ways of God or be used greatly by God. God's ways will continue to be a mystery to us until we present ourselves to be greatly used by God to mysteriously bless someone. <laughs> One of the ways that God works through people, and that, that person didn't think that they, that they didn't have anything to offer, you know, God will bring a word through them that can change the course of our life, right? We, we can't just, just, just arrogantly think somebody has to have a status to be able to have a word for us and engage us. See, God will use us to bless them. They will use others to bless and transform us. You see, we cannot grow as one body as God has ordained for us to grow if we're scared and continue to be suspicious of one another or heaven forbid, looking down on one another because of their status. We welcome others to the church with open arms in the same way that Jesus has welcomed us with open arms. So when we return to in-person service, Try changing seats on Sundays. Meet someone else during the time of fellowship. Choose to eat with someone different during meals. Let us together break the, the, this, this spirit of, of, of partiality and favoritism and discrimination in the church that we can be as welcoming as Jesus empowers us to be. Now, James reiterates the solution to this problem, and it's the law to love your neighbor as yourself. We hear this, and in the, 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 the shutdown of our ego and discrimination and partiality and favoritism, there is this edict, this law that seeks to cure all of the ills of society and allow us to function together as one unit if we could just love our neighbors as ourselves. Yeah, hmm. You would think that it would be easy to love uh, our neighbors as ourselves because I see people on social media all the time liking their own statuses, talking and, and looking at pictures of, taking and looking at pictures of themselves, looking at, uh, loving our neighbor as ourselves should be easy, but it seems that it's not. Why? Maybe because we really don't love ourselves as much as we let on 
Maybe we've been using all of these external things and surrounding ourselves with things to make us feel good about ourselves when in reality, we don't really love ourselves. And we don't love ourselves because we don't know ourselves. How are you defined this morning? Are you defined by things that will go back to the dusk? Defined by things that don't matter in an internal sense? Loving ourselves is not just words. For if we loved ourselves, maybe we'd take better physical care of ourselves. We would eat more sensibly. We would exercise. We'd watch what we take into our bodies, watch what we put on our bodies. If we loved ourselves spiritually, we would study scripture more. We would pray more. We would seek to be in the fellowship with others in the church more. We all know that love is an action word. And it does not take much to discover that our actions may not equate to a love relationship with ourselves. We don't love ourselves because we don't really know who we are. If someone were to ask you the question this morning, who are you? What do you say? Do you immediately start, start talking about the address where you live or your education or where do you work? Those things are external. But who are you this morning? Many can't answer that question because they have no idea. When you want to know about something, you got to first look at who made it. Why was it made? What was it created to do? See, this is how we begin to know who we are. When we discover that we are created by the Most High God. We're created by God to worship God, created to love God, and through our actions be a witness for God in the world, a witness uh, that, that God loves me, and because God loves me, I can love you. God loves me enough to save me through his son, Jesus, that I will, will, will have eternal life through him. So when I understand who I am through the lens of my creator, then when someone asks, who am I? With boldness, I can say I am a child of the true and living God that created me, saved me. And now I live to be a witness for my God to the world. You see, this definition is not predicated on things that are variable in my life. This definition is not predicated on employment status, socioeconomic status, zip code, country club membership, political party affiliation, none of those variable things. You see, when we define ourselves by these variable things, we are constantly confused about ourselves. Therefore, cannot be in a love relationship with ourselves and our neighbors don't have a chance. You see, we don't know ourselves apart from Jesus. And we also cannot truly love ourselves apart from Jesus. When our status is saved by Jesus, this breaks the spirit of selfishness that grips and imprisons us. When I already know that I am secure in Jesus, then I don't have to continue to foolishly build my own kingdom. I'll just concentrate on my part in building the kingdom of God. When salvation breaks my selfishness, then I can, can, can have functional and healthy relationships with others. I will be a better employee. I will be a, a moral business person. I will be able to love my neighbor as myself because that will be a major part of my worship to my God that I owe everything to. External things won't have that, that, that penetrating and imprisoning effect on me. They don't, I'll realize that they don't do anything to feel a void inside of me that's reserved for Jesus. You know, one of the saddest things I saw as it relates to this matter on um, the day that I graduated from high school, we were lined up uh, close to 400 graduates and they began to call the names of the graduates as we walked across the stage. And I remember standing in line and, and, and one of my classmates at the time started making petitions and trying to get people in the line to cheer for her when her name was called. And I thought how empty a person must feel inside that the accomplishment of graduation is just not enough and we still have to be validated by the praise of others. 
and that's still not filling the void inside of us. See, you're never good enough to yourself apart from Jesus, no matter how much good you may do, no matter how good people may tell you are in your own mind, there is still an emptiness and a feeling of inadequacy that can't be silenced with more pictures and more promotions or, or more wealth or someone calling your name as you walk across the stage. It can't be silenced with more children, more clothes, more vacations, because those things do not fill the void that's in us that's reserved for a relationship with Jesus. You know, elders and deacons would sometimes ask me the questions of, what is it going to be, uh, what, what is going on with the, with the membership when it comes to service and attendance and giving? You know, at our meetings, we would discuss these things, and I would say, you know, many are having an identity crisis right now. They're trying to define themselves with things that don't make sense. And I trust that God will make it clear that the person that they're trying to be is not the person that he created them to be. Then they will come running asking the question, what more can I do because I'm saved? They will, they will then understand that being saved is not just a status, but, it's, but, but that security that demands a response. Not just saved, but saved for what purpose? And when that happens, there'll be no more prejudice, no more favoritism and avoidance in the church because we'll all understand that God has put us here together because we need one another. When we come together, there can be a celebration of our uniqueness instead of running around and running from one another because we're different. When we understand that, 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 that we're saved for a purpose, then the 20% that is usually shouldering the physical load of the church can get some relief in the form of more laborers into the vineyard. When we understand that, we are saved for a purpose then the 10% that's shouldering the financial load of the church can get some relief in the form of more sacrificial giving from all. But we understand that we're saved for a purpose, then we can love the unlovable, give hope to the hopeless, provide for the needy, because the greatest lesson from a saved status is that it's not just about me. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning in today to our worship. And why not continue this study through our Tuesday and Thursday evening Bible study? For the link, please email me at pastorportis at gmail.com. There'll be no um, children's ministry today. And again, if you or your family uh, are still in need of disposable or cloth mask or other forms of personal protective equipment. I have them in abundance. Just give me a call and I will provide them to you at no charge. Thank you for allowing Veronica and I to lead you as we submit to the leadership of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us finish our worship in song. God bless you and God keep you.